Tonight, I am delighted to introduce our member speaker, Robert Carswell, who will speak on New Zealand advertising stamps. Robert Carswell is a resident of Montreal and is married to Cicely Lawson. In 2004, he retired after over 30 years in the law profession, practicing corporate law. At age 10, he caught the stamp bug from a friend of a from a friend's grandfather who gave him an assortment of worldwide stamps. From there, he specializes and focuses on today's presentation, New Zealand adverts, and he has also exhibited uh, three areas, Tuscany, Ionian Islands, and Fume. I hope I pronounced that correctly. He is a member of the mainstream national Feltite societies, including the Lakeshore Stamp Club in Montreal and the North Toronto Stamp Club in Toronto. So it is my pleasure then to welcome Robert Carswell as our guest speaker tonight on New Zealand advertising stamps. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I, uh, I'm particularly uh, happy that uh, David Foote and Gene Wang are present tonight because they're responsible for me becoming uh, uh, interested in this. This you know, I, I, I people like John Wilson and uh, Ingo Nestle and so on know that I collect lost causes. Uh, you know, the Confederate States and Fiuma and New Republic and Ionian Islands and so on. Well, this this particular cause has to be the most lost of them all. <laughs> you know, uh, a bunch of a bunch of really cheesy advertisements uh, printed on the back of stamps and that lasted in the public domain for seven and a half months in 1893 doesn't exactly you know grab the attention of the world. But those of us like uh, like Gene and Andrew and David rather uh, know know that, uh, that it's, it's got a certain strange appeal. Uh, what happened was that during the wonderful in-person meetings or suppers we used to have before PSSC, I haven't been to one for a long time, we used to have supper in, a, in one pub or another, and it was there that David Foote put me on to uh, New Zealand adverts and suggested that I, I contact Mowbrace in Wellington in New Zealand. And my wife and I were on a trip to, to New Zealand, and I headed straight for, for Mowbrace and came out a good deal poorer. Um, but that, but that's how I got started uh, with my uh, collecting these things, and um, I know that Jean collects collects them as well, but only in, rela in relation to her health uh, uh, exhibits and so on. But Jean also did, performed a great service for me. She put me in touch with a dealer in Sarnia. Some of you may know of him, uh, John Armstrong. He is one of the rare people who actually cover, uh, co uh, is, have, makes available New Zealand adverts. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, it, it's a crazy, uh, specialty to have. And, uh, the reason it's crazy is very simple. When the, 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 the it's, it's unlike collecting any other sort of steps. There are no covers. There are no letters. There are no rates. There are no roots. Uh, the, uh, the uh, denominations are, are secondary. And to put it mildly, they're not beautiful. So how do you, how do you, how do you justify collecting those? Well, I don't know how you justify it, but I do it. Um, the the Bible, because there every every uh, most specialties have Bibles. This this is the this is the Bible for. Uh, I guess I can't show this properly. This is the Bible for New Zealand adverts. It's a, a book put out in two thousand and six in New Zealand by J. A. Robb, and it's just terrific. It gives you uh, all the details that you need to know. Before uh, I, before we get to the to slide, back, actually showing some stamps, I just wanted to do a little bit of the history of the uh, of the New Zealand adverts back to, starting in the early 1880s. Sir Joseph Ward, who was the Postmaster General of New Zealand, um, re recognizing that New Zealand was then in a pretty deep depression economically, figured out a way he was going to make some money for the government. So he thought that you know, I'm going to put advertisements on the back of stamps, and you know we can sell those ads to the uh, to the to the uh, to the advertisers, and bring in some money. So he went to tenders, and uh, somebody by the name of Alfred Trub Trubridge 
won the contest to manage the uh, the, the New Zealand uh, underprinted adverts. Um, and for, for his purpose, for these purposes, Mr. Trubridge had had promised to pay eight hundred pounds a year for three years. It's, well, it's these they were not dealing in high finance. So, let me now show you the the at least the, the I'll show you the first slide, please. Those those are the the uh, that's the good side of the nine stamps which were underprinted. This this these are the so, so called second side faces of Queen Victoria. The first, uh, the first side faces didn't have postage and revenue stamps. These, these they're just postage stamps. These are, as you see, postage and revenue. The um, the underprinting, uh, the underprinting was done by the government, which is an important thing to to, to recognize. The, the the underprinting itself was not done privately. So you had first of all a layer of gum on these nine stamps, and then over the gum uh, printed were the the uh, extremely satisfying. That's 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 a that's not right. Uh, uh, cheesy advertisements. Um, so let me show you, let me show you the pride and joy of my before going, going any further. Pride and joy of my collection. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, the the one after that. That's these aren't pride and joy. You can tell they're not my pride and joy. Next one. This is a block of as you see a block of thirty. Um, underprinted stamps, the eight penny stamps to be exact. Um, I'm not aware of any other large multiple such as this. I'm sure they exist, but I'm just not aware of them. You know, somewhere in New Zealand, in somebody's attic, there may be an actual sh a whole sheet of these stamps. Each sheet of the uh, of the definitive stamps, whether it's one penny, two pennies, right up to one shilling, has 240 stamps on it, six, uh, four panes of 60 each. The, uh, the uh, underprinted ads are exactly the same for each of the denominations. So that uh, Creases Coffee has got this, this particular, uh, as you'll see the upper right-hand corner of this particular block, has exactly that spot on every sheet of every denomination of these, uh, of these uh, underprinted uh, stamps. How many sheets were issued? How much? How many? How much? How much was was were, was were all of the definitives underprinted, or only some of them? There, a, a, a member of the F, another Robin Robin Gwyn, uh, spoke to uh, a group of uh, philatelists in in uh, in New Zealand a couple of years ago, and he uh, he maintained that there was uh that nobody knew that the, all the records with respect to the numbers of uh, underprinted stamps had been lost and uh, he must have done the necessary research just recently stanley Gibbon, gibbons has said uh, in three different spots that i know of that there are only 500 sheets of you know in the grand total of all the denominations of underprinted uh, uh stamps i don't believe that because if you go to the Mowbray catalog, you'll see there are hundreds of these stamps being offered at very low prices every single month. So I'm not sure where, where Stanley Gibbons got that number from, but I've asked them to, to, to let, get, let me know that what their sources are. I just asked them a couple of days ago. Um, I'd like to revisit this block of 30 later on uh, when, we've had, when we've got some more information to give you before then. So to, could you go back one uh, slide, please? Typically, uh, philatelists get, you know, we get interested in the, in, in the details. And one of, one of the details which we get interested in here is in the three different settings or printings of these, uh, in under, under printings of these things, one after the other. And you, you, we learn the hard way how to differentiate between the different settings. The, uh, the, the, in the first setting, which was uh, in print from February of 1893 until April of 93. The, um, if you have the queen on one side as upright, the uh, advertisements on the other side are upside down. Or if they're, if they're, print, if they're sideways, then they, they read from top to bottom. So that, that top line you see of, of uh, that's, this is your introduction for those of you who haven't done uh, underprinting uh, 
New Zealand adverts before, you get some idea of the types of uh, ads that these uh, that that are that are available. So, in the if as I say in the first setting, if the if the wording of the advert is upright, it's inverted and related to the Queen's portrait. In the second and third settings, it's upside down and 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 rel relative to the Queen's uh, portrait. I, I it's, it's it's probably not necessary to go into into more detail on these on these things. So, so let's move on to slide four, please. You've you've seen a block of uh, of uh, of thirty with it with a scattering of uh, of uh, underprinting all over it, a, a scattering of New Zealand adverts all over the back of it. This the Beecham's Pills uh, ad adverts are all clustered in one corner of the sheet, the bottom right hand corner, and this is a sampling of four of those advertising such wonderful things as cough pills and pick pills for sick headache and pills that purify the blood. Flirting with legal problems there, by the way, we'll get to that later on. Now I've, I've referred to at the bottom of this, uh, of this uh, slide, uh, positions. The, what uh, Mr. Rob has done in this, in this book that I showed you a minute ago is to give pages, each of which, four pages, each of which does a, a, a quarter of the full sheet and assigns to the different adverts numbers. So we know that you can, I, I, you, you, with, with great detail, you'll find out that Beecham's Pills Restore Appetite is position 226 and so on. Uh, it's quite an art to, uh, to identify the different positions of these adverts, all 240 of them, you could just imagine. In Quebec, we would call it a travail de Benedictin, a, a, a monk's job work. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a slightly larger, a rather nice uh, block uh, in third setting. Uh, the uh, and then three individuals, uh, individual stamps. These are all on. I suppose I suppose a Brit would say tuppenny stamps. Have I got that right? Uh, you can see how in, invariably the gum discolors the uh, the ads because, of course, the gum lends a sort of a beige background to them. Um, Burl Bonningtons, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the individual advertisers uh, in a, a little more detail later on because they're fun. Uh, and you can see why they might be with such things as... Uh, Bunnington's Irish Moss, Universal Specific for Colds, Fry's Cocoa, which you're probably familiar with, Sunlight Soap, which everybody knows, and down below Beecham's again, and a, and a, and a single dentist, that sort of thing. Uh, next, please. And here are some, uh, here's some more. I'm, I'm showing these mint blocks first because they're all very hard to come by, and they're, they're the best they're the best looking. They're the, they're the only eye candy that that anybody could possibly allege that, that, that uh, New Zealand underprints uh, could provide. Um, the, uh, the these are on the, the the three penny orange yellow and three pe three penny uh, slightly darker yellow stamps, uh, and you can see the selvage on the on the bottom uh, on the bottom block. And the bottom block also has a water mine, watermark line across the top. These, these stamps are all watermarked, but I've not gone into that detail for the purposes of this presentation. Next, please. Beecham's Pills. I'm sure you've all heard of Sir Thomas Beecham, who was the conductor, uh, uh, one of probably one of the world's best known classical music conductors based in London. Um, his, I think it was his grandfather, if not the grandfather, the great grandfather that uh, started the Beechman, the Beecham's Pills firm in uh, in London. Uh, it was probably because of uh, the success of Beecham's Pills that Sir Thomas had enough of a nest egg that he could take the, to do the musical studies. Um, my question is whether Beecham's was making some promises here that they couldn't keep. And I'm going to be giving you some more details on that. Only a lawyer would do this, mind you. Um, when, when, a, when a particular advertisement here says that uh, Beecham's pills is for sick headache, is there an implication there that it can cure sick headache? 
uh, or invigorate the nerves or restore appetite or uh, cure nervous ills or for a disordered liver. Right away, a lawyer says, how can one set of pills cure just about everything that there is to be cured? Gene would be able to answer that. that the answer is it's impossible. So these, you know, they were they were flirting with the law, and it, it and in, there are a couple of cases where the companies flirted too closely with with the law on these matters. So these 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 are kind of fun. There's some on here that are you know female complaints. Ooh, we don't talk about such things. Constipation. So they, they get pretty rough. They get pretty close to the line. Chest afflict. Every anything you want you care to name. Beecham's pills will cure. Next, please. Bonington's Irish moss was made from uh, moss grown in New Zealand. It's a, unlike Beecham's, which is based in Britain and had branches in New Zealand. Bonington's was a native born uh, company. Charles, could you possibly uh, show, give, give uh, zoom out a bit? Oh, thank you very much. You can't, it's hard to read those, to read those without the zooming. But again, Bonington's gives you a prompt and effective remedy for lung disorders. If you have a, a cold, you should, you should use it right away. Every dose, every dose of Bonington's Irish moss is effective. For asthma, you should use it. For bronchitis, you should use it. Singers should use it. Stop coughing. You know, it's obviously something that's intended as a cough or cold <laughs> remedy. The question is, does it do what it claims to do? So again, I, the, the lawyer has to ask this, this question. Next, please. Then we've moved to the biggest advertiser, Sunlight, Sunlight uh, Soap, which of course is uh, still going strong, based in London, uh, at least it was then. Uh, it, it had 28 messages, 28 advertisements uh, on the 240 stamp sheet. It was by far the largest participant uh, in the whole initiative. Um, can we can we zoom in on that, please, Charles? So these this is pretty good too in, in terms of uh, in terms of claims. Sunlight soap. If you go by the wonderful advertisements on the back of these stamps, on the one hand, should be used in in washing lace, ladies' lace, that top row, third from the left. If you go down a couple of rows, it also is used for washing dogs <laughs> and also for and would you believe washing prize poultry <laughs> my question there is this isn't a lawyer's question this is a layman's question how the hell do you wash a chicken i don't i don't get that and but if you do you must be sure to use sunlight soap uh because it never disappoints you should take no other and you don't get chopped chapped hands uh, gold miners are supposed to use sunlight soap. Why gold miners? Silver miners are supposed to use sunlight soap. Um, that I, I, I'm not, I guess that means miners with their dirty hands from working very hard in the mines, that they need a particularly strong soap. This is the same soap that is used to clean lace. I do not understand how they managed to sell any soap, but they, I guess they did. Um, I guess I, I, I should at this point tell you about the uh, the famous case of the carbolic smoke ball. I'm sure you're all familiar with the carbolic smoke ball. Uh, oh, this was the, this the <laughs> the carbolic smoke ball case was one of the first cases we learned in law school it had to do with the law of contract. It's a British case. It went all the way to the Court of Appeal in, 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 in Great Britain. The, car, the, 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 the carbolic smoke ball itself consisted of a tube with a little ball on the end of it. And I don't know, they, they somehow pumped some vapor into it and you, you, you suck the vapor into your lungs. And it, they, they guaranteed in their advertisements, not on, not, on, uh, not on the backs of stamps, but just as a general principle, and their advertisements said, we guarantee that this will cure the flu. And the flu that they were talking about was the epidemic of flu in 1890, which was the 1890 equivalent of COVID. 
it was a very serious uh, or the or the post world war 1 uh, epidemic they guaranteed that it would cure it and they even offered 100 pounds to anybody who took the cure to took the carbolic smoke ball cure and were not and were not cured so a lady whose husband was a solicitor uh, which must have helped because she she sued and the court said uh, no this is uh, this is mere puffery. No, you can't. You can't take. You can't take a, a guarantee like that seriously. So they they appealed. They went to the court of appeal, and the court of appeal said, "No, this was a contract. The on the one hand, the promise was made by the by the uh, carbolic smoke ball company. On the other hand, the promise was accepted by virtue of using the uh, carbolic smoke ball in accordance with the instructions, and it didn't work. So the court." ordered that uh, 100 pounds and costs and interest be paid to this lady. This was uh, a major victory. So will this, would this apply to uh, companies like, uh, like Bonington's or, or, uh, or, or Sun Light Soap? That remains to be seen. But there was one case where it actually was litigated in New Zealand, and we'll get to that. The next, uh, next line, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm wanting to show all of the every one of the different advertisers, which is the reason for having uh, uh, for the sort of random look of these things. But these are the smaller advertisers. You know, six only. Lockheads only had six, and Strange only had six. Strange is interesting. Because Strange was uh, apparently had the, the largest department store in in New Zealand. Uh, Lockheads sold perambulators and baby carriages that's what they advertise and then as you see creases tried to sell coffee and Ponica, Ponica was selling whatever they've lost track of Ponica they can't locate them uh, even now they're selling uh, uh, food products next uh, please then we get to where's McBean lower left McBean Stewart's new cure for asthma and diphtheria that promise, if it is a promise, it, it says it's a new cure, so I suppose it's an undertaking of some sort. That was taken to court, and the uh, not to court. It was taken to the uh, the governing body of medicine in uh, in uh, New Zealand, which held that McBean Stewart had uh, engaged in, had 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 perpetrated a gross uh, breaking of medical rules and had uh, punished punished them accordingly so there is one instance where uh, at least one of these advertisers was held to account for making a statement that couldn't be true to, to find a, a new cure indeed they, they thought this was medical fraud we've seen lots of medical fraud uh, in even in most recent days as you well know um, one of the curious ones on this page is the Cadbury's because it doesn't say by Cadbury's chocolate bars, it says this space is reserved for Cadbury Brothers. So this was a first setting uh, stamp or first setting. Uh, thank you. Uh, it was a first setting uh, underprinting, and uh, they they reserved it for Cadbury Brothers. But Cadbury Brothers never took it up. Therefore, in the second and third settings, Panicky took them. That appears to have been what happened. And then one of my favorites, of course, is the is flag pickles. If you move a bit to the right there, Charles, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, it's above that. Isn't that great? Isn't that a, a terrific? I, that that probably is an effective ad for pickles, because each each you have to think each time you're each time you're putting a, a stamp on a <laughs> on an envelope, say, oh yeah, I like pickles. I must try those. That 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 makes some sense. Um. The, in the very bottom of that page, there's a uh, there's you'll find the, the 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 poor the poor cousin of them all, Wilton's poor little Wilton's there there in the lower left of 240 places on the back of a sheet of uh, of these stamps, Wilton's got exactly one place, and the lower white hand is further further down, Charles, into the right. Keep going, you're there. Okay, that's it, Wilton's. See, besides Selsaline, so. The interesting thing for me, it has nothing to do with this uh, topic, is that uh, my grandfather lived on uh, 
Waterloo Street in London, Ontario, between St. James and uh, and uh, Grosvenor, and down the down the street, down down at at, at Waterloo Street, uh, two or three houses was a, a, a pharmacist, name of Wilton Milton, if you could if you can imagine, exactly the same name, Wilton's, excuse me. As a kid, I used to go over there and play with my friends. That has nothing to do with anything. I realize that. Um, the uh, so you see, there's a tremendous variety in the in the numbers of, of ads, in the in what's advertised, in the in the in the uh, risks that are taken by the advertiser, and you can see why people would be fed up with them. They're pretty cheesy, and the New Zealand people did rise up in opposition to this whole um, to this entire business. We think. There's an exception, however, to every rule. Next, please. Oh, yeah, this is, there are there are odd colors involved. You can always tell that you can identify some settings by the color. And green, green, green under underprints are supposed to are quite valuable in relation to the usual colors and blue ones even more so. Uh, for all that's worth, you can see a few of them there. Next, please. Yeah, and every 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 collector of stamps loves varieties. So you've got uh, a five pence uh, stamp there with uh, double double perforations, which of course find their way onto the underprint. You've got uh, Mr. Gwynn, who uh, lectured the uh, the philatelists in in Christchurch a few years ago, said that these twelve by eleven and a half uh, underprints, that is to say, underprints on Stamps that are perforated 12 by 11 and a half are very rare indeed. I don't know. You see them quite regularly on, for sale as well. Um, and then down at the bottom, you get you get doubled underprints. And they, those are quite common. They're quite, quite interesting to see the doubled ones. You get, they, they're, they, some of them, the, the doubling is subtle, but they're, they've obviously gone through one set of underprinting. And I know that didn't show well enough. Let's, let's show these wonderful underprints a second time. Do it right over. Next, please. So we thought we were finished with underprinting because uh, the uh, the people of, of uh, New Zealand had, had risen up against them in 1893. Well, here we are in 1909 and 1915, and what do we have? More adver more advertising on stamps. They are not, however, underprints. They are stamps on the front of booklet panes. Um, they're um, much nicer to look at. And they uh, they advertise such things as Abdullah Egyptian cigarettes, Dainty's Embassy chocolates, Dainty's nice biscuit, and Jay's fluid, which is some sort of uh, disinfectant. Have you heard of it? No, I've heard that was Jay's from Northampton. Yeah, it's it's a, a Jay's. It says here that Jay's is a disinfectant fluid for external use, used for used by gardeners uh, for patios, greenhouses, driveways, and drains. Uh, and so that they got, anyway, this, that, at least the, the stamps were not disfigured. It's only the selvage that got disfigured, if you can talk, talk about that. Uh, next, please. And then in 1915 and 1935, more uh, advertisements on booklet panes. Abdullah Turkish cigarettes again, Kodak. And down, down, down below, you have the kiwi. I'm a bird watcher, so I, I'm interested to find the kiwi on on their stamps. Um, and they're advertise what they're advertising there are Parisian ties. Uh, the, the, the whole idea, the idea of advertising ties seems a bit far fetched, but uh, and there's a there there are there's a variety there. One, the, the clouds in one pane. Are, are faint and darker in the other one if you look carefully enough. So naturally, the uh, the stamp collector has to say, "Oh yeah, I got to got to show both of those." And then finally, the last slide. Oh yeah, thank you. That 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 shows the reason. That shows them very well. Thank you. This is the this is the last slide. This was the British attempt at underprinting, and a peculiar one it was. We're in 1889 now. It's going back in time for uh, again. Uh, as it says there, the, the Postmaster General of the United Kingdom asked De La Rue to put, uh, the, uh, to, to put adverts on the backs of stamps. 
and they did they they produced trial versions of those on the 1881 one penny lilac and the 1887 half ver, half pence half half d vermilion and bears they cut the governor the, the sorry the postmaster general never proceeded with the idea but pears went ahead and un, independently printed over the gum and several companies pears soap we, we're all familiar with pears soap you find that in the uh, in the bathrooms of gentlemen's clubs and the uh, the peculiar thing is that these were never authorized by the government, and yet they are duly listed in Stanley Gibbons catalogs, and they're very hard to come by. Um, I don't know if they sold any soap using them, but there they are. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've concluded my presentation and would be happy, happy to answer questions if I can. Well, before we get into uh, the questions, I, I've been asked to uh, thank you for your presentation, and I feel privileged to do this. Uh, this has to be one of the most, uh, hard to choose words, interesting, fun presentations, I think, that we've had at the PSSC. Uh, definitely eclectic. Uh, we can't uh, say that you're... Uh, you're, you're uh, the, the regular type of collector, uh, Bob, but th that, that is most pleasing uh, in this case. You, you're having fun with what you're doing, and you're showing us that we should look at the other side of our stamps every once in a while. Heaven knows what we'll find there. So thank you very much for your presentation. You're welcome. Pleasure. Pleasure.